All right, we're going to start, um, we're going to continue with acoustics of consonants today. I have to warn you that we're having some technological glitches um, you've all experienced in terms of some other things like your exam and things like that. Every single time I come to record, I have to experience a kind of technological glitch. Um, this time it is my pen has an issue writing, which I had also doing the last lecture. Um, the pen I have to kind of keep, if I move between the mouse and the pen, the pen would stop writing. So I'm going to try to make it as smooth as possible without having as much as interference in the way I'm giving you the lecture, rather than trying to figure out the technological glitch. So bear with me if I'm kind of going back and forth. Um, the people here are very good about editing that, so you don't see it as much. But I would just say, bear with me if I'm kind of feel I'm distracted when I'm trying to write with the pen is because I'm trying to figure out between the mouse and the pen, okay? So let's continue with acoustics of consonants today. We finished um, the first part of the consonants. We talked about how, for us, in order to understand the acoustics of consonants, we have to be classifying them based on manner of articulation. So we have four different manners of articulation, the nasals, the fricatives, the stops, and the affricates. We covered the acoustic cues or how to understand whether it's a nasal or a fricative in our first lecture. For nasal, the main cue that you see on a spectrogram is the murmur. You will not see anti-resonance on the spectrogram. Anti-resonance is the negative peak or the negative, um, like negative peak where there is no amplitude. So those are some of your cues for, uh, for um, nasals. And for fricatives, we talked about how it's being produced. The high energy is one of the main cues for um, fricatives. The high energy um, is about 4,000 hertz for the sound and 2,000 hertz for the sh sound. And we also said that the acoustics um, for those fricatives is based on where the production is in your uh, vocal tract and there's complete occlusion of your vocal tract, um, there's um, um, constrictions in different parts of your vocal tract to produce those sounds depending on the place of articulation, okay? So today we're going to continue and talk about stops and affricates. Now, stops is one of the, it's got a lot of cues and I'm going to try to correlate how the stop is being produced to the cues in place. So I'm going to try to um, slow it down and explain it in detail so you have, it's, it's not an easy concept. So just pay attention to this. Stop, pause, take notes, uh, go back, use your textbook, um, and see if you get this concept. If you're not, you also know where you can find me, okay? All right. Stops are non-resonant consonant. What was something that was a non-resonant consonant as well? Fricatives was a non-resonant consonant because you don't see any form and structure in that and it's a non-resonant consonant. But fricative is a continuant, meaning it can be prolonged, right? Fricatives can go s but the difference is stops is not a continuant and stop is going to be something which cannot be prolonged. It's, it's transient. So if you go I'm sorry, that was fricative. Okay, those are sounds which are stops, which cannot be prolonged, but they're transient. The stops have the greatest degree of obstruction. The degree of obstruction is based on um, where the um, articulators are. So for example, if you have the p and the b, the greatest degree of obstruction is because your lips are coming together, okay? There is a momentary cessation of airflow. Think about this. This is a very distinguishing characteristic. This is a very important characteristic of stops. There is a momentary cessation of airflow. This is important, remember, because an acoustic cue is going to be associated with that. So think about this. I want you to produce a sound. And then when you produce the sound, before you release the p, what happens? You momentarily preventing the air from flowing, okay? So there's a momentary cessation of the airflow in producing any sound. So take that articulated position for the and see, before you release those sound and before they can be heard as an audible um, sound, think about what happens to the airflow. There is a complete block of the airflow. So there's complete occlusion of the vocal tract, okay? The sounds that are stops, which I've already been saying out to you is B, d, g. So voiceless, no vibration of the vocal folds, and voiced, 
vocal folds vibrate. Okay, so it's a non-resonant constant, so you're not really going to see a lot of form and structure. Okay, then there is a greatest degree of obstruction. There is a momentary cessation of the airflow. If I ask you what is one distinguishing characteristic of stops, you have to say momentary cessation of the airflow. Very important. Complete occlusion of the vocal tract. Okay. And I want you to pr produce the sound before you release the sound. I want you to feel how there is complete occlusion and momentary cessation of the airflow. And those sounds are voiceless sounds are p, b, sorry, p, t, and k, and voice sounds are b, d, and g. Okay? So, what happens during stop production? Think about this. Stops are not nasal sounds. So, if they're not nasal, what happens to your velopharyngeal port? your velopharyngeal port has to close, right? When the velopharyngeal port closes, so this is stage one or phase one, okay? Your velopharyngeal port has to close. Your occlusion in the oral cavity has to happen and that depends on the place of articulation. So lips versus tongue versus velar position, right? right? So, okay? So occlusion happens in the oral cavity, depends on the uh, place of articulation, right, in which one is going to close it. So that's stage one. Those two have to close. When in stage two, which is this, there is increase in intraoral pressure. Intraoral pressure is nothing but the pressure built in your mouth. So when you completely close your vocal tract and you seal your velopharyngeal port, you have this area full of air which is what is increase in intraoral pressure during the hold or closure. Very important, okay? Then, once you're ready to release it, there is release of all air pressure by re releasing the oral occlusion. That is stage three or final phase, okay? It's important for you to know all this because all of these phases are going to be associated with something called the acoustic cues for stops. Okay? So what happens during a stop production? It's a, not a nasal sound. Okay? Your velopharyngeal port hence has to be closed. And in order to produce that sound, you have to occlude your oral cavity. And the occlusion depends on your place of articulation. So that becomes phase one. In your phase two, in that hold place where everything is occluded and there is a hold phase before you release all that intraoral pressure, there is a strong build or increase in that intraoral pressure during the hold phase. And then you're releasing all of that air pressure by releasing um, the um, occlusion, okay? In this stage, increase in intraoral pressure, there is no airflow out of the vocal tract, okay? Now, when you release all of this airflow, there is airflow here. It, re it doesn't result in a continuous sound like fricative. It was s instead it is b, p, t. You see how that there is a release? It releases in, results in an audible burst of noise. Okay, so this is where you know that it's not a continuum, but it's a very transient sound and it cannot be prolonged. So let's reiterate the three stages in stop production. The first stage is you close your velopharyngeal port and you close your, um, you occlude your oral cavity and it depends on the place of articulation. The second stage, there is no release of airflow, but there is building of increased intraoral pressure during the hold or the closure phase. Then once you're ready to release, your, um, the air pressure is released, there is an airflow um, release. The airflow is released as an audible burst of noise, and it's not a continuant, it's very transient, it cannot be prolonged, okay? So, so far we talked about stop, stops are non-resonant, it's not a continuant, it's um, transient. So if I asked you an example of a non-resonant continuous sound is p, your answer is to be false. Why? A non-resonant transient sound is p, then your answer has to be true, okay? So what are the acoustic cues in the stop production, okay? So let's talk about it. 
So in phase two, we talked about the hold period. This corresponds to phase two. We talked about this hold period or closure in articulation where there is no flow of air out of the vocal tract. That period is called the silent gap, where there is really nothing happening because all of this air is blocked in your intraoral cavity. There is no release. It's all in hold. Okay. So how do we identify the silent gap on a spectrogram? On a spectrogram for voiceless stops, there is nothing visible on the spectrogram. But for a voice stop, you saw a voice bar. Remember we talked about a voice bar in s and sh. I'm sorry, s and z, the voiced voiceless cognate, s and z. Okay. And if you remember, here, that was the voice bar that indicated that it's a voiced sound. And here, there is no voicing bar, so it was a voiceless sound. So in a silent gap, also, you're going to observe that is on a spectrogram for voiceless stops, there's going to be nothing visible on the spectrogram. But for voice stops, you're going to see a voice bar, a band of low frequency energy, which shows about vocal four vibration. OK? So, if I were to point here to you, that's the silent gap. And there is a little bit of voicing bar right here in the silent gap. It's more evident here. Okay, voiced sound with a bar, voice bar. Here, there is no voice bar. Okay, that's a silent gap. Now, so stage two resulted in a hold position where there was buildup of all this intraoral pressure. And so there was really nothing for voiceless sounds because voiceless sounds, the vocal folds don't come to vibrate. So it's actually a gap that you can see on the spectrogram. But for a voice sound, you're kind of, your vocal folds are trying to come together to start the adductory position to produce the voicing part of it. And that's why in the silent gap, you actually see a voicing bar. The next stage for stop production is to release that air that's been in the hold position. In order to release that air, when you release it, we said it was going to result in an audible burst of noise. And hence, that skew that you see on the spectrogram is going to be noise burst. Okay, see how it correlates with how stop is being produced? So that the silent gap correlates to the hold position when you produce the sound. And when you release it, we said in the final phase, the releasing results in an audible burst of noise. And that's what you see on the spectrogram as well, is the audible burst of noise, and it's called noise burst. It's at the moment of release. It appears as a vertical line or spike. More prominent in voiceless than voice. That's why I've always p, t, and k has more visibility of the noise burst, not as much visible on the um, voiced part, okay? So it's like the very thin line that you see right there. It's not as prominent as the, um, as the voiceless sound. Okay, so it's at the moment of release, it appears as a vertical line or spike extending to the high frequencies in the spectrogram, right? It follows a silent, um, it follows a silent gap. So if this was a silent gap right here where I showed you where there's nothing, it comes right after the silent gap because it's the release of air after the hold position. Noise bursts are very brief. It's about 10 to 35 milliseconds, okay? It's usually when you observe, it's seen in stops in the initial and medial position, but it's not mostly not seen in the final position as stop is unreleased in, um, English. So let's take a few examples of that. Okay. Now, when I take this example, okay, when I'm going to produce those stops in the final position, it's hat, tap. Okay, I'm not saying hat, tap. I'm not releasing that p, right, or the t. I'm keeping that in a very unreleased position. So it goes hat, tap. Right? I'm not releasing it. I'm just closing and ending it. But in terms of kick, you see how I had to release the K, the K? So it's not true 
in most of the sounds, but for some sounds, it's true that in the final position, stop is unreleased. So if you had to draw a spectrogram of tap, you will see that there is a release of the t in that medial position, in the initial position, but in the final position, there won't be a noise burst. No noise burst in final position. Okay, so let's reiterate here. I want you to get this concept very clear. Silent gap is seen as a cue on the spectrogram when you are in the hold position or closure position where this intraoral pressure builds in your mouth. When you release that, we said the releasing will result in an audible burst of noise. And that's exactly what's seen on the spectrogram called as noise burst. Noise burst is at the moment of release. It appears as a vertical spike or line. It's more pronounced in voiceless than voiced. Okay. It follows the silent gap. So always when you indicate, when I ask you to draw the cues, when I ask you to draw and point to the cues of a spectrogram for the stops, you should be always aware that the noise burst follows the silent gap. Okay. Noise bursts are very brief because it's a transient sound and not a continuant. It's usually seen in stop initial and medial position. And for um, in most of the final positions, it's an unreleased stop in English. Yeah, but there are exceptions like cake. Okay, So we got two cues so far, silent gap and noise burst. Now what's the third cue of um, stops? Okay, That's going to be called the formant transition. So let me draw over these. Okay. This rise and fall that you see okay, are going to be your formant transitions. So formant transitions you know happen when right after the occlusion is released. So you have silent gap during your hold, right? And then you have the noise burst when there is release. And right after it's released, you have the form and transition. Because when it releases, it needs to move to another speech sound. And there is change in resonance peak of vowel tract when there is a change in your um, resonance. Okay. So form and transitions occur when there is a transition from one speech sound to another. For example, here, it's going from, you see all this right here? That's the initial part of the production of that sound. And you see the voicing bar right here. There's no voice bar right here. It's a voiceless sound here. And then when you see the transitions here, right, Every for each um, transition, the next thing that you see here will be a vowel sound. OK, so there is movement from the production of. So this is a combination called the CV, which is consonant followed by a vowel. OK, a consonant followed by a vowel where the consonant is getting produced first, which is a stop sound. And then when it transitions to produce that vowel, you see the form and transitions because of the sudden change in resonant peaks of your vocal tract. Not vowel tract, this is a typo here. It's vocal tract. OK? These transitions are called form and transitions. Now, the form and transitions, we know that we talk about F1 for, 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 for first formant and F2, the second formant, in terms of vowels. If you remember your vowels lecture, E, A, and U, E, your F1 is 300, your F2 is greater than 2,000, it's about 2,300, right? And then greater than 3,000, I would say 2,240 or 2,400, depending on what your book or my lecture note says. A, it's about 790 or 700, 1090, and greater than 2,000. U is at about 300, 870, and greater than 2,000. All of these are in hertz, right? Form and frequency is measured in hertz, OK? So keeping those vowels in mind, your form and transitions are also going to change whether it's going to be a rising form and transition or a falling form and transition. It's going to depend on what kind of vowel there is. Okay, so let's talk about this. We talked about position, whether the form, if, whether your stop is coming in a consonant CV form formation or a VC. First the vowel comes and then the consonant is produced later. Okay, so 
F1 transition, which is your first formant, which is the first line here, that's an F1, that's an F1, that's an F1. So what are the three sounds? It's all voice sounds here, B, D, and G, okay? Now if you look only at the F1, look at the pattern, these, this part, Okay, this part that I'm marking here is your transition, F1 transition. What is the commonality that I'm marking when I mark in terms of my transition here? Is everything rising or is everything falling? Okay, look at that and you can say that F1 for all three sounds, B, D, and G, is rising. F1. I'm only asking you to focus on F1. F1 is the first formant on your spectrogram here. You're seeing that as the first formant down there. So gi, ge, gi, ge, ga, ga, go, gu. Different vowel sounds. Irrespective of the neighboring vowel, whether it's e, a, 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 O or U, irrespective of any vowel sound that is here, always your first formant is rising for all the three stop sounds here. So, irrespective of place of articulation, always rising for stops followed by a vowel, which means anytime it's a CV combination, first the consonant comes, then the vowel comes, it's always going to be rising. It's always going to be falling for a VC combination. Okay, so for example, if it is ig, egg, um, ag, ag, so if I were to do that, that's how my form and transitions are going to be always falling when it is a VC combination. Okay. I know stops are one of the tough um, manner of articulation to understand in terms of acoustics, but if you think about it, it's actually easy. So we talked about three so far, and I haven't finished the form and transitions yet, but I want to reiterate. We talked about the silent gap, which was co corresponding to the hold period in the production. And then after the whole period, when we release it, you got an audible burst of noise, and that is your noise burst that you see like a vertical spike. It's only 30 to 30, 10 to 35 milliseconds in duration. It's very transient. The stop cannot be prolonged. Once you finish the release of the stop, there is a neighboring vowel that's going to follow it. You're not going to just say, right? Anytime you will produce a sound with the stop, there's going to be a neighboring vowel sound. So when you produce that neighboring vowel sound, we notice changes in the form and frequencies in your vocal tract. The transition from your stop to your neighboring sound will result in something called the form and transition. The form and transitions are classified as F1 transitions and F2 transitions. We've only talked about the F1 transition so far. So with F1 transition, irrespective of the place of articulation, whether it's a bilabial, whether it's a palatal, lingua palatal sound, or a velar sound, irrespective of the place of articulation, F1 transition is always rising, always rising in a CV combination, meaning when a consonant is followed by a vowel, it's always rising the F1. It's always falling for stops following a vowel, which is what I've drawn here in a VC combination. This is very important because in your midterm, this question is going to be there. I'm going to ask you that F1 transition is always rising for stops following a vowel. Is that right? No, it's not because it's always falling for stops following a vowel. Okay, so pay attention to this. F1 transition is always rising for stops in a CV combination. Remember this graph, and it's always falling for stops in a VC combination. So CV, F1 rising, VC, F1 falling. Okay, important for exam.